there they go, bro. Look at him. Look at him in the beach. Look at him in the beach. See if I can make it. Thing number one, number one that you need to see to know that there's snook or fish in the area in general is bait. If you show up to a beach and it's Bahama blue clear water and there is not one speckle of bait in the water, keep walking, jump in your car, go to another spot. There is no reason for a snook to be there if there's no food. And even if a snook is there, he's probably not feeding. He's probably cruising on by. Or... He might be happy to show that you put a pilchard in his face. But in my personal opinion, if I go to a spot that has no bait, no life, life invites life. So if there is no life, there's not a lot of inviting going on. I'm going to move on to the next spot. Okay, thing number two. I'm trying to look for bait, but if I see birds working water, if I see birds kind of flying around, hanging around the area, that's a good sign that the birds are feeding on something. If the birds are feeding, chances are there's fish. If you see birds working, diving, hitting that water, you need to do everything you can to get to where they are. Snook are very spooky. Snook are not going to want to be around the birds that are bombing in the water. However, they will be in that area because that's where the food is. That's letting you know, hey, there's food here. Your possibility of finding fish is there. Fish live for two things, to mate and to eat. When do I go? When is the most practical time to go snook fishing on the beach? And I'll tell you right now, I have caught snook as early as March and as late as November. Now, that's a big window. But when did I consistently catch snook off of the beach? That is going to be between May and August. That's the window, at least in South Florida, where you're going to have the best chance at catching snook off of the beach. Right on the shoreline, right around jetties. That's when they're spawning. That's when you're going to get a lot more snook activity than the rest of the year. Now, when it comes to snook, if you're watching this video, you've probably looked at other videos and they're all going to say the same thing. And I'm going to repeat it. Snook feed off of the tide. They're tide dependent fish. So you don't want to fish a slack tide and you might want to find out what tide is producing the most activity. Not all tides are created equal. I, I can't explain that. That's something you have to go and fish consistently three, four times a week and start figuring out when the bite is. But if I had to pick a bite where I will go fishing it's going to be incoming tide right before high tide, that little window before it goes slack. Incoming tide from the middle of incoming to the high tide to the slack of that. That's my favorite window. Looking at today's tide chart, I'm going to want to fish from around 7 in the morning to around 10 in the morning when the outgoing tide is moving the most amount of water. Avoid slack tide and then I'm going to want to come back at 3.30 in the afternoon, probably fish that till 7 on the incoming tide when the water is moving the most. And it's also around sunset. And if you're finding any of this information helpful, I would really appreciate if you guys press the like button just to let me know that what I'm doing is working. And if you think I'm not helping you, let me know what I'm saying wrong. Okay, so we've gone over what time of the year. We've gone over the tides, like I said, very, very important. Um, but more than anything that's important is just go fishing. Just go if you can go. But the next step to increasing your probability out of fish is understanding the barometric pressure. Fish on a high pressure system tend to bite least. They tend to not bite as much on a high pressure system Theory is that the high pressure squishes their body, their internal air bladder, making them feel full, making them feel a little bit more reluctant to go out there and gorge. Now, you want to fish on a low barometric pressure system, meaning when it's like nice and cloudy and gray and ugly and rainy, that is the time to get out there. Throw on your raincoat and go out there and you fish your butt off and you start working that spot. Pay attention to the tide. But like I said, if you can go, go. And that low pressure is typically when I've caught the most amount of consistent fish. Those after, 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 one after the other. And it, it wouldn't stop. Time of the day. Uh, is it morning? Is it evening? Mid-afternoon? Is there any particular time of the day? My personal experience, absolutely. My favorite, favorite time to go out there and fish for a snook is the evening. I'm talking between 5, 6, 
to around seven or eight o'clock. I have caught the most amount and biggest fish in that little window because as we all know, these snook are predators. And what helps a predator is when their bait have less vision. So when that sun starts to set and visibility starts to get reduced, that's when these snook fire up. So think about what you need to look for, for an epic day of fishing. So for the perfect storm to catch the most amount of snook and my biggest snook have come with this formula. Low pressure system, nice, rainy, ugly. Incoming tide, water was flowing in, water was moving, bait was being flushed into the beach. At the evening, right around sunset, an hour before sunset, it was starting to get dark. If you can line up those three things, if you can find that day, you need to put everything on hold. If you're really serious about getting after these fish, hit the beach and start fishing. Now, when you get out to the beach, there's other things you have to look for. Another form of structure that is gonna always hold some snook is gonna be some seaweed. Don't get scared of seaweed. Seaweed is what holds a lot of bait, shrimp, crabs, even tiny bait fish. And the snook will sit underneath those seaweed mats, just eating what they can. So sometimes you're gonna have to go to a weedless rig and drop that thing right on the seaweed or on the edge of seaweed and work it along the bottom and you're probably going to get a lot of seaweed and grass on your line, but you got to give yourself an opportunity to catch the fish that are there. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's impossible. And another thing you want to look for when you see a lot of seaweed around are color breaks, where some brown wa murky water kind of breaks into like green or clearer water. That color break is, is going to have the tendency to hold a lot of fish because the bait are sitting in the clean water while the snook are using that dirty water as camouflage as they work around and they feel with that big, thick black lateral line where the hell the bait is. And fishing color breaks, fishing the seaweed, and fishing anywhere where you see a change in water texture, where you see a lot of breakers, but then there's a spot where it's very calm, you definitely wanna present bait in that area because there's structure there, not pilings and rocks, but there's a form of structure in the terms of contours of the bottom that will accommodate a predator's sense of hunting. So now we got all the gear figured out and we're ready to get out there and go catch some snook. So what am I gonna take? I like to pack light. I'm walking miles on the beach sometimes just because I love fishing and when I'm out there walking and I'm cat, every cast can be a memory that'll last me a lifetime. That's why we fish. That is why we fish. Every time there's a bait in the water, something amazing can happen. But I also don't want to be overly tired because if I get tired because I got 50 pounds on my backpack, I might miss that snook that was 100 feet more up the beach. So you want to pack light. So let's go as minimal as possible. You know what I do sometimes? I take my backpack and I take a 12 pack of DOA Brown. I take a pack, a three pack, a Terrorize, another 12 pack of Glow, six to a dozen jig heads. This is if I'm gonna go lure fishing in particular. And that's it. I don't need much more than that. The fish, I don't believe care for the color nearly as much as the consumer. But let's say you don't really care for lure fishing and just not your not your thing and you like it really easy and you just want to go with live bait. Here's what we're going to do with live bait. You're going to take your medium size rod, medium to heavy size rod. You're going to take your 45, maybe even 35, 100 size reel. You're going to have your 20 pound bridge, your 20 pound fluoro. You're going to take your cast net. Um, like I said, in Broward County in particular, we have to deal with, uh, I think it's up to seven feet. In Miami Day, there's no real limit on your cast net, okay? Um, or maybe you're just gonna go buy them. Typically, they're anywhere between 15 to 25 a dozen. So they can get expensive pretty quick. I honestly, I usually go with at least one dozen, one dozen pilchard. And then if I can catch more, awesome. But I'm gonna I, I like ensure that I have some live bait for that trip. So like I said, when you get there, you wanna hook that pilcher through the cartilage of the nose and no weight. You wanna let this thing swim. You wanna cast him out and let him swim because what the pilcher's instincts are telling him to do is exactly what the snook is expecting for him to do. So if you put this pilcher on a sinker, you are restricting that pilcher to a certain spot. Maybe you gave five feet a liter, that's a 10 foot radius that that pilcher can swim in. You need for that snook to go out of his way to come and eat that pilcher. However, if you cast that pilcher and you free line him, you let his instincts take over. The snook's instincts 
are predicting the instincts of his prey. The snook is a predator. He knows where his prey is going to be, what they like to do, what he's been eating his whole life. Makes sense, right? So you want to cast this pilchard out and then let him swim. Feel in that line as it leaves that spool and you're feeling, you're going to feel him swimming. He's going to most likely, he's going to go with the roll of the current. He's going to go in the direction of the current. He's going to look for a safe haven. And you know what's usually waiting for him in these safe havens? Snook and Tarpon. And Jacks are just ripping everywhere, eating anything they find. So when, that's, when that pilchard is free lining, he's going to go where his instincts tell him counterintuitive to what the snook's instincts tell him. The pilcher is saying, go with the current, while the snook's instincts are saying, hey, sit here in this trough. My eyes are angled on top of my head. I'm going to sit low. I'm going to look up. And the second I see my food coming, he's going to come dart and crush that thing. So you got to let that pilcher do what he wants. Let him swim. The more time your bait's in the water, the better. And, and don't catch a pilcher, bring them in, cast them. They're not hardy baits like a goggle eye or a blue runner. These things can't be, st they can't stand to be casted more than four or five times. And you're going to kill them. Let's say you're fishing on a rocky structure or there's a piling and you see like a rip of water forming around it. Cast him up the current. Let the current bring him back. And just let his instincts take over. I'm telling you, don't overthink it. Don't try to be smarter than the snook. Snook are smart, but they feed off of instincts. So just cast that thing in the current and let that pilcher do his thing. Because that snook has been eating his whole life. He knows where the bait is going to be. And your bait is going to want to go exactly where that snook is expecting. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? It makes sense. But when you have the ability or the possibility to go snook fishing, take your gear, and you get out there and you work as hard as you can and pay attention to the details. There's things that happen invisible to the eye that set these fish off. And you need to be able to catch it. Was it a change in temperature in the wind? Was it the wind direction? Was it the pressure system moving in? Was it moving out? Was it the tide changing, which is a huge factor? You're gonna notice when you start understanding tides and how fish work, you will be able to know where fish are gonna be the second you walk out, okay? So pay attention to these details. These details are what make fishing a science. And if you go out there and you get skunked once and you get skunked twice, don't give up faith. But when you do have a hard time fishing, look at the details and understand why it happened. Maybe the moon wasn't right. Maybe you went on a full moon. Maybe you went on a new moon. And start making notes. Start making notes of the temperature. There's always something that is the reason of why they bite and why they did it. And if you're having a hard time catching these snook in the beginning, don't give up. I went, I, I went at least two months with no, with not much information fishing for snook on the beach. And the first snook I ever caught was on a DOA shrimp. I wasn't even working it properly and I still managed to hook a snook, but I was so consistent and I was paying attention. I seen a patch of seaweed and I felt that maybe he was be sitting there popping shrimp or maybe there was some bait and it worked. And I hooked him and I was ecstatic. You're gonna see him right here. It was a little guy, small thing, you know? But I tell you what, after so much persistence and so much hard work to catch that fish, he could have been the size of an embryo and I would have did a backflip. I almost did. You got to want it and, and you got to really pay attention and understand what's going on. And if you have any questions, just, just ask me and I'll help you as much as I can. Okay, so we've gone over what time of the year. We've gone over the tides, like I said, very, very important. Um, but more than anything that's important is just go fishing.